up, everybody? My name is Nick Murphy. I'm one half of the Brothers Murph, and this is You Can Solo That? You Can Solo That is a series where I go through the games on our shelf behind us here that have solo variants, try them out, and then review them for you. Today, we're going to be looking at a game that I think is pretty underrated, and that is a game called Archmage. Archmage is a wonderful game by Starling Games, who make like Everdell and like Nemo's War and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it's a game that kind of flew under the radar. We talked about it this week, actually, in our top 10 underrated games. And it's a really, really good game. And one thing that we found when we got it was that it has a solo variant. So we're like, sweet, gonna try that out. Because the more we played the game, the more we liked it. We liked it more and more and more. And so I was like, man, I'm really excited to try the solo version. Now that I've kind of like figured out a little bit more about the game and the concept the concept where you are all mages and you are trying to become the arc mage the best mage in the whole world and so it's an area control game where you have these different spells and these different spheres of magic like will magic and matter magic and like death magic and blood magic and all these different kinds of things and learn different spells that have to do those kinds of magic so there's all these different spells in the game and as you learn more and more in these different spheres of magic you get access to these different spells it's super cool, super fun way to go about that. And on top of that, there's a good area control game around it. And so I was curious about how the solo game played because the game is okay at two, but it's really much better at like three and four. And the concept, the concept of the solo game is that there's a rogue like warlock, like a rogue mage running around who's just like all crazy and stuff like that. And it's essentially mostly going for area control. And you're essentially trying to out area control him. And then you're also trying to gain master mastery in four spheres of the different magic. And so that's the basis of the game. And I was like, I'm not sure how that's really going to work because the two player game is like not ideal. It's fine, but like it's way better at three and four. So I was very curious of how the solo game was, but we're not going to go straight into the final thoughts. You're going to have to wait for it because we're going to talk about what's different in the solo game. So now I always give this disclaimer is I'm not teaching the entire game. I'm just teaching what's different in the solo game. So let's get it down to the table. Let's figure out what's different. And I'll meet you back here for the final thoughts. All right, so this is all the stuff you need for the solo version of Archmage. For the most part, the setup is pretty similar, but there are some changes, so we're going to go into the changes right now. You're going to find the little Warlord Mage, which is this token right here, and then you're going to give them a, just a random color of followers. These will be their followers. And then there is a Warlord's Hexagon right here, and this will dictate the Warlord's movement and then the die that goes along with that, and just keep these near the board. But this is all the Warlord needs. They don't get any cards, they don't get anything else, just followers and the Warlord themselves. You're gonna get your different sp spheres of magic boards, and then you are going to set up the different planets alignment like you do in the normal game, where you randomly put them in these different spots. And then this game is gonna be 15 rounds. So you're gonna have to take two of the planets at your choice and move two of them back one spot. Doesn't really matter which ones, it's up to you. Go ahead and pick a follower color of your choosing and then go ahead and pick a random mage, whichever one you want. And then the mages cards, you're going to have to actually go ahead and take out all of these master cards. Master cards have this little something up here in the corner. You're going to need to take that out. You will not use these in the game at all. They are out of the game. And then there are four cards in your normal deck that do not work in the solo game. So they gave us different versions of the same cards that work in the solo games, and you will have to switch them out. The solo game, by the way, is denoted by this little symbol right here, which is supposed to be the Warlord. So Decay here will get replaced by Torment, Shadow get, will get replaced by Defuddle, Imprison will get replaced by Corrosion, and Fiery Chasm will get replaced by Inflame. So take these ones out, and put these ones in your deck. Then you're gonna have to prepare all the wilderness tiles. So you're gonna take five of each wilderness tile, which is gonna leave you one left over, and you're gonna take these one left over and throw them out of the game. You're not gonna be using them. And the rest of these 25, you're gonna shuffle up all randomly and then put them out on the board. The camp tiles here are gonna go on these six spaces right here. The town tiles are gonna go on these four spaces here. And then the wilderness is gonna fill out most of the rest of the board, which I will do sped up right now. All right, so that is us all filled in. Now you will have one wilderness tile left over and you are going to throw this out of the game without looking at it. You should not know that it's a mine. Nope, not a mine anymore. It is thrown out of the game so you don't have complete information. The Warlord is gonna start right here at the center of the board and then that is gonna complete the setup. Now let's get on to gameplay. 
So quickly, let's go over the concept. The concept. Of the game and how you win it. So essentially is, is you're battling the warlord and you are trying to beat them out. And how you do that is you have to, within 15 rounds, get mastery in four different spheres of magic. And then on the board, you need to have majority in three of the five wilderness locations. We have ruins, libraries, groves, crypts, and mines. You need to have majority in three of them by the end of the game. And if you have mastery in four different types of magic and control of three different types of regions, you win the game. So now in the game, every round, the warlord is gonna go first, but I'm actually gonna describe your turn before the warlords, cause your turn remains mostly unchanged. And so we're gonna do that one first, despite the fact that you don't actually go first in the round. Now, in terms of the main meat of the game of you moving around the board doing stuff, that doesn't really change. The only thing is, is you cannot move into a spot with the Warlord. That's pretty much it. The only main differences come through your spells here. So the majority of your whole sphere of magic works the same way. When you get an apprentice and a certain type of magic, you then get that spell. If that apprentice goes away because it promotes, you then lose that spell. And that's totally the same. The main difference comes when an apprentice moves up to master level. Because as I said, there are no master spells in the entire game. You can never gain access to them. So what happens when you move an apprentice to master. Well, what happens is actually pretty cool. You can see there's a sphere right here, a sphere that goes in the whole death magic mastery part. So instead of getting the master spell, instead you're gonna get these two spell and this spell, regardless of whether or not you have an apprentice there. So that's pretty cool. So I'm gonna get the torment spell, the corrosion spell, and the befuddle spell. All three of these now I permanently have because I have an apprentice at the master level. And then if I put someone here, okay, I can totally do that, but it doesn't change this at all. No matter what, I'm always gonna have these three. So it actually kind of makes up for the fact that you don't get any master spells because once you get to the mastery level, everything below it, you just automatically know. And then everything else about your turn is the same. There's no difference for you at all. All right, so now let's get into the Warlord's turn. The Warlord is always gonna start at the center of the board here, and it's always gonna have all 25 of its supporters. It doesn't have 15 and then 10 to recruit later like you do, it just always has 25. And also, whenever you kill one of the Warlord's supporter, it just goes right back into their company. It doesn't go back to their supply and then they have to like re-recruit them like you do. It just goes right back and they have them available always. And now the Warlord is going to move around the board on his turn. And again, he is going to go before you. You go second. And how the Warlord moves is dictated by this hexagonal tile right here. So as you can see, the hexagonal tile has a bunch of die faces and then directions. So on the Warlord's turn at the very beginning, what you're going to do is roll out the die that they provide. And then whatever number comes up, the Warlord is going to move in that direction from the center of the board. So let's say we roll a three. A three is down in this direction. So the Warlord will either move to the inner ring or the outer ring, and will always alternate between the two. So if it went to the inner ring this turn, next turn it'll go back to the chasm and then you roll again, and then it'll go out to the outer ring depending on where you roll for it to go. But for the first turn of the game, it's always gonna go to the inner ring. So let's just say he goes right here. And that is how the Warlord gets onto the board. And then what you're gonna do is you're going to re-roll the die a second time. If it is an odd, like this two here, he is then going to move clockwise around this ring. In this case, the inner ring or the outer ring if it was next turn. If you roll an odd, he is going to go counterclockwise, again, around the inner ring or the outer ring, depending on where he is. And then he gets five movement points just like you. So let's say I rolled that two, which means he's gonna move clockwise. So his movement points work the same way as you. He can explore, so he'll use one to explore this tile. And just like you, he'll always basically put a follower there. And then he'll just go clockwise to this one and keep going around. So there's no one here, so that'd be one and then two, three, four, five, and then the Warlord would end their turn there. And now the Warlord will stay here on the board until its next turn. And then once it comes to the next turn, it'll go back to the center, you roll the die, see where it goes, and then it'll go there. And it stays here, if you remember, because your mage cannot go into the same spot as the Warlord. And always make sure to put down the Warlord's apprentices so they have control over these spots, and then it goes to your turn. 
So let's say the same thing happened. We went here and the room going clockwise, but you have some of your people here. Again, the warlord will behave normally using movement points. So it'll go like one and then kill one of your people, two, and then three. And then if you have a ward here, just like you would to them, you're gonna get rid of the ward for one movement point, one more movement point to kill this person. The warlord will always do all five of their movement. Even if it leaves them in like a less than optimal position, it doesn't matter. It'll always do all five unless it can't. And the only reason why it couldn't is because let's say this was gonna be the last movement spot. A warlord can move through the spot with your mage tower or your mage, but it can't stop there. So if it had more movement, it could just go one, two, three, flip, four, five, flip. That's no problem. But if this was going to be the fifth movement, then it would just stay here because it can't be on the same spot. And then at the end of the warlord's turn, if they land on a spot, a wilderness spot that they control, they will then ward all the spots around them with the normal place wards action, which just makes it harder for you to get their people off those spots. And then that is the warlord's turn. And that is pretty much the crux of the game. The warlord is just gonna be moving around the board more or less at random, depending on where this dice goes. And it'll just be kicking stuff off and taking control. It's really good at getting control. So you're constantly having to fight back against the warlord. Because remember, you need to have majority control over three of the five different wilderness spaces. And so it's pretty tough to do, but that is it in terms of the differences of the game. The only thing we're going to talk about last is we're going to go over the new spells that you get in the game and talk about those a little bit. So let's get into that. So again, you get four new spells for the solo game. The first two we're going to go over are Torment and Befuddle. Now we're going over these first because they're both very similar and these ones you can actually cast on the Warlord's turn. So Torment is pretty easy. You roll the Warlord's die, and then if it turns out you didn't like that die roll, you can cast Torment and then essentially re-roll that die, and then you have to take the second option. Befuddle is somewhat similar where you cast it on the Warlord's turn, but in this case, after the die is cast, you can cast Befuddle here to then add or subtract one to the die face. Again, changing then where the Warlord would go. Then we have Corrosion. Corrosion here allows us to get rid of wards. So what it does is when you go to a spot with a ward, you can cast Corrosion and you will get rid of that ward and every ward adjacent to it that your enemy controls. It won't do anything to the followers, but it does get the wards out of there, which then makes it much, much easier to get these followers out there and replace them with your own. And the last one here is Inflame. Inflame is the most complicated and it's actually, I think, pretty underutilized, at least by me. So when you cast flame, you get to put one of these inflame tokens on any of the mythic being enclaves with the exception of demons. You can't put it on demons. And then basically, let's just say I chose gnomes. So when you have inflame down, we put this inflame token down on gnomes. So now when we roll this dice, let's say we roll a six, this warlord would then pass over this inflame token to go out in the direction of six, which is out here. And when the Warlord passes an Inflame token like that, all of the Wilderness locations that are associated with this mythic being that have wards on them, the wards go away. So in this case, the Warlord passed over the Gnomes, and the Gnomes have an Inflame token. The Ruins here are associated with the Gnomes. They're both yellow. And so all the Ward tokens on the Ruins would then go away. And this gets even cooler if there are no wards. If there are no wards there, instead of getting rid of wards on those spots, the followers would go away. You don't piss off the gnomes. So by the end of the 15th round, or before, if you meet it before, you need to have mastery in four different types of magic, and you need to have area control over three different type of wilderness locations in the game. So in this case, I have libraries, I have groves and then i also have the majority in the ruins so i got that point i have four apprentices here in the mastery of four spheres of magic and we are good to go and then if i did that by the end of the 15th round i would win the game if i didn't i would lose and that is how you solo archmage so that was archmage so here's the thing, how is it? I actually really, really like it. I think it's super fun. And one thing I like about it is that it plays similarly to the multiplayer game, but it still definitely feels very different. You have to do things differently in this game because at least in all the games we've played in multiplayer, you end up getting one, maybe two mastery spells. That's it because they're very difficult to get. So in this game, you end up getting four mastery spells, which is kind of interesting because in a normal game, you usually can't do that. 
but it's also different because you don't actually get the master spells. And that really worried me when I was reading the rules for the solo game. I was like, I want the master spells though, because they're super beefy. They are, they're master spells for a reason, but you don't get them, but instead you get all the magic spells in that sphere of mastery. And I think that makes up for the fact that you don't get the master spell because you end up, at least in my experience, you end up getting access to more spells in the solo game than you do in the normal game, despite the fact that there are six spells that you can't get ever. And that actually works really, really well. So that part of the game works well because it's still tough to do because you have to get the apprentices in the spheres of magic and then promote them to master. But then you essentially get all the spells below that. And that makes up for it because then you don't have to focus on filling out the lower ranks of spells like you do in a normal game. Because once you get to the master, a lot of times the lower ranks of that sphere of magic tend to get completely depleted on your road to the mastery. In this one though, once you get there, you just automatically have the other spells. And that makes it really, really, nice because here's the thing the game is tough it's really really hard i've played it three times now and i've won it two out of the three times and the two times that i won i had to take all 15 rounds to do it i was not able to do it earlier and it came down to the wire i was like okay i need to get one more relic so i can do this so i can go over here to do this and do this and do that and then i can make it work and i did and it's really really fun but it is tough but overall, the game is super fun. I, I just I just enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed the journey. I enjoyed the differences in how it feels to the multiplayer game because in a normal game, you can kind of predict where people are going to go, what they're kind of going for. But with this like rogue mage, you have no idea where they're going to go. And so it's hard to plan for that. You can like set yourself up like, okay, I've got majority and all this and all this and all this. We're good. And then the mage goes over there and just goes like, <laughs> and essentially just wipes out a bunch of your people. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I just lost the majority. I need to win this game. So then you have to like go back over there and try to like get majority back. And it's, it's that kind of like random like placement of the rogue mage makes it interesting in my opinion and overall it's really really fun i liked it a lot i'm really excited to play it again and explore it more and yeah two thumbs up for me uh they did a great job with it uh the game again I, I think is really underrated i think it's a super fun game that's just flown under the radar and if you've been interested in it um and you like solo gaming give it a shot because it's got a good solo variant as well i think it's really really fun um and yeah i dig it i dig it hardcore so those are my thoughts on the solo version of arc mage that is going to be it for me please make sure to like and share this video and subscribe to the brothers murph if you haven't already and until next time we've been checking out arc mage here on you can solo that and i'll see you later Hey there, everybody. Thank you so much for watching that video. We honestly really, really appreciate it. We just want to take a second to remind you that we are sponsored by Restoration Games. We are also play all of our games on top of Game Top is right here, which is these beautiful luxury game tables. And you can go to Game Top or LLC to find out more and to upgrade your gaming experience. We also have a Patreon. If you have a couple shekels lying around, you like what we do, please feel free to throw them at our faces. We will not say no to them. Thank you so, so much for being here, and we'll catch you later. All right. Oof. All right. Mikey, what do you want to do? You want to get Ty? Nick! Jesus. Oh, my gosh. Big face disheveled Nick. You can't just do that. Sorry, not sorry. What are you guys doing? You guys getting Thai food? I love Thai food. I want some. Give me some. No, you can't have Thai food. Why not? No, you can't have Thai food because you don't eat food. You're not real. You're not real. No, I'm not dealing with you right now. I'm not dealing with you right now, okay? I'll kill your children. What? What? You guys getting Thai food? What?